As a teenager, I read a short story written 130 years ago by Frank R. Stockton and entitled, The Lady or the Tiger? Stockton's work is widely included in short story anthologies and even given a nod in dramas or films because it is famed for its very unique ending, or perhaps I should say, non-ending. If you're unfamiliar with the story, I'll offer a brief summary. It takes place in an unnamed land where a semi-barbaric king presides over his court by using chance to, per to determine a person's innocence or guilt. When a subject is accused of a crime that interests the king, the defendant is tried in a public arena, picture the Roman Colosseum, in which are two soundproof doors identical in appearance. Behind one is a beautiful maiden, carefully selected as a desirable match whom the accused must marry if he opens that door. Behind the other door is a ferocious and hungry tiger. Should the unfortunate accused choose the door concealing the tiger, he is considered guilty and will be devoured. Now, as fortune would have it, the king's own daughter, who herself can be conniving in vain, falls in love with a man of lower status, and at the order of the disapproving king, the man is brought to the arena to choose a door. Whichever door he chooses, he will be lost to the princess forever. The princess has learned in advance which door hides the tiger and which one has the lady and she discreetly indicates to her lover that he should open the door on the right. The man unhesitatingly steps forward and flings wide the door, but there Stockton's story ends, and it is never revealed what was behind that door, so we don't know if the princess jealously led her lover into death, if I can't have him, no one will, or selflessly saved his life only to have him marry and love another woman. Stockton's final sentence is, and so I leave it with all of you, which came out of the opened door, the lady or the tiger. Stockton's story became a fascinating study of the human motivations of love and passion, mercy and jealousy, virtue and vindictiveness. The poet Robert Browning publicly professed his belief that the man chose, and therefore the princess indicated, the door with the tiger, while many other readers, famous and not so famous, debated the ending in various public and literary forums. But the thing that gave the story such vitality, and gives it still even today, is that the lady or the tiger leaps off the page of the book and into the minds and the hearts of its readers. The ending cannot be written without the reader. The ending written by the readers indicates how they see the world. And how they see the world perhaps says much of how they approach or live in the world. And how they live in the world in turn shapes the world. Is the world merciless? Or filled with mercy? Ask the reader. Is the world selfish and cruel or selfless and noble? Ask the reader. Now why do I begin this Easter Sunday by speaking of a story intentionally left open-ended by the author that finds its continuation or completion in the response of the hearer? Well, in the odd way that my mind works, the lady or the tiger is the story that came to mind as I read today's Easter story from the Gospel of Mark. Of all the Gospel resurrection accounts, Mark's is the most ancient, and in its earliest form, the most frustratingly incomplete. John's Gospel includes a beautiful encounter between Mary Magdalene and the risen Jesus, whom she first mistakes for a gardener. In Matthew, the eleven remaining disciples meet the risen Jesus atop a mountain in Galilee and are given the dramatic charge to go and make disciples of all nations. 
in Luke's gospel, the risen Jesus appears to his followers, eats a piece of fish to show his corporality, blesses the disciples, and is taken bodily into heaven in their sight. But Mark, the account I love the most right now, well, Mark has three endings and no ending all at the same time. Verses 9 through 20, called by scholars the longer ending of Mark, are different in style and in textual construct from the rest of the gospel, making them a clear later addition to the text. A footnote in my study Bible says that the longer ending appears to be composed of a mixture of elements from the other three gospels and acts added in the second or third century. There's also an ending called the shorter ending of Mark that reads, And all that had been commanded by them they told briefly to those around Peter. And afterward Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west, the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. It appears to have been added after the third century. In some old manuscripts, the shorter ending is followed by the longer ending. In a few manuscripts, the longer ending is followed by the shorter ending. But some of the most ancient authorities bring the book of Mark to a close with verse 8. The women come to the tomb. They encounter a young man clothed in white who tells them, Jesus has been raised, he is not here. Go and tell his disciples he is going ahead of you to Galilee. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And that's it. If the earliest version of the earliest gospel ends there, then there is no encounter with the risen Jesus to tidy things up. No last words or final instructions from Jesus' own lips. In his book, Binding the Strong Man, biblical scholar Ched Myers writes, the power of Mark's gospel ultimately lies not in what it tells the disciples or readers, but what it asks of them. The discipleship narrative begins with an invitation, follow me, and at its end, it invites us once again to follow. He is going before you to Galilee. Not worship me, not believe in me, follow me. So you see, the ending lies with the disciple or the reader. Do I follow? And following, the trail leads to Galilee. Now a word here. Can we all agree that in the world's terms, the most satisfying Hollywood-type ending to the story might be for the risen Jesus to saunter into the court of Pontius Pilate and say to the Roman authorities, I'm back. So to whom will you bend your knee now? The emperor or me? Or perhaps for Jesus to just turn up in the temple and say to his trembling Pharisaic foes, your religious views are in error, you are thoroughly bankrolled but morally bankrupt, and I'm here to set things straight. But he does neither of those things. In Mark, the risen Jesus simply goes ahead to Galilee. And where exactly is Galilee? Well, practically speaking, it's nowhere. Galilee was, in Jesus' day, a rural region of farming and fishing, of peasantry and poverty. So think about that. The risen Jesus does not go before his followers to Jerusalem, the center of Jewish national and religious life, and he doesn't go before them to Rome, the power center and the economic center of the world of Jesus' day. He goes before them to a poor and powerless place. And he calls them to follow him there. He calls us 
to follow him there. Now I don't mean he calls us literally or geographically to follow him to Galilee. But he calls us to follow him to where the poor reside. Why? Well, would we expect the risen Jesus to contradict what he taught in his earthly life? Blessed are the poor, the mourners, the meek, the merciful, the persecuted, the peacemakers, the pure in heart. Blessed are the reviled. Blessed are the overlooked and the overwhelmed. They will be comforted, they will be filled, they will receive mercy, they will be called the children of God, they will see God. Now, where is Galilee for us this Easter? This strange COVID-19 Easter? Well, the virus itself reveals where Galilee is. You see, the virus, as is ever true of hardships and tragedies, rests most heavily upon the poor and the disadvantaged and the vulnerable. I'm sheltering in place and watching movies. And I'm anxious, and I'm inconvenienced, and I worry. But the poor? How does the virus rest upon the poor? It was in the early days of the virus here in the U.S., sometime about the middle of March, that our daughter Hannah stopped off at a drugstore in downtown Atlanta and she met a man with no shoes who asked her do you have anything to eat? Middle of March no shoes, no money, no fast food places open in a part of town that is a food desert do you have anything to eat? Well, Hannah went into the drugstore, the only place open. She bought a bag of junk food, the only food the drugstore had. And she gave the man this bag filled with cookies or Cheetos or Funyuns or whatever. And he thanked her. And then he asked her, Are you okay? You look tired. No shoes. No money, no food. Are you okay? Some might say she met Jesus. Galilee is where the homeless are. In New York City, the current epicenter of the virus in the U.S., you can trace the cruelty of the virus by zip code. The Bronx and Queens have had nearly twice the incidence of COVID-19 infections compared to Brooklyn and Manhattan. They also have more close-quartered living conditions, lower incomes, and almost 60% of the homes have a first language other than English as compared to around 40% in Brooklyn and Manhattan. Galilee isn't in the financial district. Another article I read observed that in places releasing COVID-19 reporting data, black Americans constituted 13% of the population, but 34% of reported deaths. A fact far likely less attributable to genetics than to economics. Who can afford to shelter in place and who can't? Who has access to testing and who doesn't? Other populations that are most at risk during this virus? The elderly? The prison population. Galilee is in the prisons. So a question I'm wrestling with this Easter is how do I follow him to Galilee when I am sheltered in my relatively privileged place, which is in the interest of the greater good and the public health exactly where I should be. Well, I can begin with the one great hour of sharing 
the Presbyterian offering received each Easter season. Presbyterian disaster assistance, which is supported by one great hour of sharing, has already pledged $2.7 million to COVID-19 response. And from the 2.7 million, 1.7 million will be allocated for domestic response and 1 million will go to international response. And of the 1.7 million for domestic response, 200,000 is specifically allocated for refugee and asylum related needs, helping the poorest and the most marginalized. And 1.5 million is for all other domestic needs. So that's one great hour of sharing resources, one great hour of sharing shelter, one great hour of sharing security. That's one way to go to Galilee. What if this were the greatest hour of sharing our denomination has ever experienced? Another way to go to Galilee from my home is to begin to consider if it's my good fortune to receive a government stimulus check, because not everyone will, and if it should be my good fortune not to need all of that check in order to survive or to pay my rent and my mortgage, to meet my needs or my medical bills, to get back on my feet, then what will I stimulate with my stimulus? Imagine the impact if enough people stimulated some form of Galilean generosity like ECHO, Ecumenical Community Helping Others, or some, so others may eat. How else can I go to Galilee? I can begin to think about, to imagine, to envision the type of person I want to be the type of nation I want us to be on the other side of this crisis. Do I want us to just get back or to go back to where we were as if nothing happened? Or do I hope for more? More kindness, more intentional generosity, more attention to quality health care for everyone more support for educators and for education, more binding of wounds, more feeding of the hungry. We will emerge on the other side of this current crisis, but I'd suggest that Easter's question is how? Will we go to Galilee? Today we stand anew at the empty tomb. Today we hear anew the summons, he has gone before you to Galilee, there you will see him just as he told you. And how will we see him? I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Easter's story is everlastingly unfinished, sisters and brothers. Its ending for this generation is in our hands. And so, to borrow from Frank R. Stockton, I leave it with all of you. Will we follow to Galilee? Or will we not? Amen. Amen.